unsullied by us humans, sex is a very good part of human life. We live our lives in a great deal of hypocrisy, telling our children to do one thing while we do something else. The quest for control. We all would love it if our lives were a bit more controllable. Discussions within the Christian community about these questions will be primary for the survival of the Christian community. I am very pleased to be able to introduce to you this evening our host for the evening, Dr. Nigel Cameron. Uh, as all of you may not realize, uh, he's been uh, lured away by uh, Chuck Colson and Washington, D.C. to become Dean of Wilberforce Forum, a very significant position uh, in, in the culture and uh, uh, playing a very significant leadership role, uh, bringing uh, a Christian understanding to bear on the world in which we live. Uh, we, are, we are very grateful that there is still a, uh, a little bit of time left for Dr. Cameron to continue to be actively involved with the center because he plays a key role here, as many of you know, uh, directing the, the board, chairing the board of the center's, the, the advisory board for the center. Uh, he's a senior fellow and, and doing very significant work in many different arenas uh, for the center. So we're delighted that that will continue. Uh, but he will continue to have a, a growing presence in Washington, D.C., in addition to his uh, worldwide work. As you know, he spends a significant amount of time in various leadership roles in Europe, as well as the United States. Uh, if he looks familiar, it's because he's been on, on so many of the major, uh, major TV news network programs recently that you, you're bound to have seen him on one network or another. Uh, let me uh, introduce to you Dr. Nigel Cameron. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for every opportunity we have to turn our minds and our hearts to your word, to seek to understand how we are to live in this world you've made, to seek to focus on the major questions which confront us in our culture at large and which confront us as Christians. Help us this evening to refocus, to focus afresh, that our minds might be enlightened, our hearts moved, and our wills engaged, that we would learn and seek to obey the truth as we would live for you in this world and as we would subdue the world to you as stewards of your creation in accordance with your will for us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening. The uh, format for this evening, which uh, I've been asked to uh, MC, is that uh, I will introduce uh, Senator Brownback, and he will address us. Uh, I've then been asked to make some comments in response to uh, his presentation, after which we will have some opportunity for uh, questions and perhaps for discussion. Uh, the evening will end extremely promptly at 9 p.m., uh, because the senator has a flight to catch and I am the chauffeur. So <laughs> we both of us will be heading for that door. Um, delighted to welcome each of you this evening, especially some friends who've joined us especially for, uh, for this evening's presentation. Uh, senator Sam Brownback was uh, uh, elected, initially elected to fill the remainder of uh, Bob Dole's term in Kansas and sworn in as Kansas 32nd U.S. Senator in November of 1996. In our 107th Congress, he serves on four key committees, Judiciary, Commerce, Science and Technology, Foreign Relations, and the Joint Economic Committee. And Senator Brownback has lately distinguished himself as the leading advocate for bioethics in public policy. And as uh, many of you will know, he has most recently introduced in the Senate a bill to ban all human cloning, a bill which has now garnered the support of the Bush administration 
and interestingly also of some leading environmental and pro-choice advocates who have gathered around this commitment uh, to prevent the application of this technology to human beings. He also recently floated a measure which would indeed uh, ban germline gene interventions. And he is committed in the long term to what he described to some of us over dinner earlier this evening as waging global war as we seek to contain biotechnology uh, within the confines of a humane and human dignity oriented public policy. It's been a, a privilege for me to uh, meet Senator Brownback on various occasions in the last few years. Um, and it's a delight on my part to welcome him to the center, our conference on this campus, um, and to introduce to you Senator Sam Brownback. Thanks, Nigel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thanks for being out. I, uh, I really, I guess I don't know what to say to you, people that would come out to hear a politician speak on a Friday evening. Uh, you know, like, they don't have anything better to do. I, uh, but I, I am honored that you are here to, uh, to be a part of this discussion and what I hope will be a discussion. Uh, I've got comments that, that I would like to make and share with you. Uh, Nigel will share some then as well and then we'll take questions and comments because uh, we're, in a, we're in a big battle and there's a lot going on and I need a lot of input, as I think most people uh, do on this and, and other important topics. It's been an interesting day for me. I was just in Kansas City earlier, started out in Washington this morning, flew out with the Vice President to Kansas City because we were starting to mail checks back to people on the uh, tax rebate. Uh, and so I was standing in front of stacks of checks. I don't know if any of them were yours. I didn't check for any of you here to see if uh, yours were. I didn't get mine out of the stack that was there. Uh, and then flying up here and then I'm going to fly back to Kansas City and home to Topeka yet, uh, yet tonight to get home with my family. Uh, we've got uh, a lot that's been going on in, um, in Washington, a lot on these bioethical issues that have been taking place. And it's just kind of like it's the, it's the opening round. Uh, it's, it's round one, uh, battle one, in a global war that's going to be taking place. And that is about the future of the human species and uh, who we are and what we will be. Uh, those sound like pretty profound questions. Uh, particularly for people in politics to take on, but that's literally the scale and that's the, the set of where we are today. I want to talk about some of those uh, here tonight. Uh, let me first tell you a little bit in my background of, of uh, what has happened to me, if, if I could, because it may frame for you a little bit uh, why I'm interested in this topic and, and why I think it's so important. In 1995, <clears throat> a, a very uh, good thing, very important thing happened to me. Uh, I got cancer. Uh, it was a melanoma, took it off, in good shape. Uh, doctor said should be fine, we'll watch it closely. Uh, but I don't know if, if, how many of you have been through this experience personally. I know most of you have been through it with others and that are very close to others. Uh, and I think you know the, the profound nature that that has on a person when they are confronted with, uh, okay, this could really, really be bad, this could be the end of your life. Um, if we didn't catch it quite right or it didn't go quite right or whatever else might take place. And it caused me at that point in time to really start to search for things that were real and things that would last uh, and things that I could count on. And I left, uh, I got the message over a cell phone in Salina, Kansas and I'm, I'm shaking at this and then we, we went through the, the procedure and everything and then I started my search. And it was, a, it was a deep and it was a tough one. I was looking for that that's real and that lasts. And I went back to the farm where I'm from in Parker, Kansas. Uh, Parker's 250 people. We, uh, we uh, lived in the suburbs. We like to think of it. We were a mile and a half out of town. Uh, we said suburbs because we were on city water and so we, we thought that should qualify for being in the suburbs. Uh, and thought, you know, the farm's always going to be here. Uh, you know, no, it's, the farm may not be, be here in the future. My parents are always going to be here. No, they're not going to be here. I went into my children's room at night and said, well, my kids will be here. Well, no, they're not always going to be here. My wife will. Well, maybe. How about the job? I'm in Congress now. That'll always be here. No, you could lose that the next election cycle. How about money? No. I kept searching for everything I could hold on to, and nothing was anything that I could, could hold on to. I mean, that was the final conclusion. And I just gave up, and I gave it all over to God. Uh, I had been a, a Christian for some period of time, but I'd been a defeated Christian. Uh, one that just had grasped enough grace to get into heaven, I thought at the end, uh, 
uh, but I had no power to live it. Uh, it was a defeated Christian. It was, I was always trying to be good and never successful at it. Uh, and most of the time, I wasn't even really trying. I was just an ambitious politician, uh, one that wanted to get a lot of notoriety and a lot of success and, uh, you know, ultimately, I don't know, move as far as I want or move as far as I'd like. For, but then I'd ask myself, well, for what purpose? Well, I want to. Uh, or I think that would be a good goal in life. I want to help people, uh, but I also want to move, move on forward. I, I uh, came around, you know, finally the conclusion <clears throat> that, that Jesus is the only thing I've got to hold on to. Amen. I mean, that's, that's it. I can search the world over, and I did. And that's all I found to hold on to. And it was such a beautiful, liberating thing. You, you must know people that are in politics, and when you get in this business, you get to a point of, of uh, looking at everything uh, from where you are and maintaining where you are, because your identity comes from being called senator, or being called congressman, or being called secretary, or this. I mean, your identity becomes your title. And so if somebody can take your title away from you, they are a mortal enemy. <clears throat> and so you look and always are constantly looking, okay, now how am I doing with my constituents? How's this here? How's that going? Uh, and you know, so you, you get tired of people always playing politics, but I think if you look at it from the reverse role of the politician, who does seek to do good, <clears throat> but whose identity is wrapped up in, in the position that he or she holds, you start to understand in the pressure to become uh, everything to everybody and not offend anybody. Uh, and we enter into this great fear of man, because you're always fearful. What if this person comes along and tries to remove me? What about this group that they might get uh, offended by me? So I can't do this, I can't say that. Uh, and pretty soon you are just boxed in. And fear is at every door, because you could lose this, and that's who you are. And then you've lost who you are. Now what do you do? The beauty of realizing that, that uh, Jesus is everything, as fear goes, faith and fear cannot occupy the same space. You have faith, fear is gone. You have fear, your faith is gone. Um, and it was a great liberating thing. Uh, I, as a chaplain of the Senate, and we have a wonderful chaplain who said, uh, to me one time, which was so true, uh, you know, Sam, you have one constituent. It's God. If you're all right with God, you're fine. If you're not, you're not. Instead of thinking, okay, I've got 2.5 million Kansans that are my constituents, and they are. But you can't always constantly look at things as a fear of what each of them may think, may do, may want. Uh, but if you can look up to God and say, what does God want to do? And you know what? The American people love that. They love people like that. My poll numbers went up. Now I feel like everything went much better when I said, what's God want to do? What would be his purposes? What would he be after? So I got into a number of different fights. Got into fighting for the people of the Sudan, the really embattled faith community there. Got involved in a number of these bioethical issues. And at my core, what I want to do is renew the American culture. This culture needs renewal. It needs renewal like William Wilberforce brought in Great Britain uh, at the late 1700s, or early 1800s. We've got to get back to first principles, and we need to. And we are in a culture war of the greatest magnitude in this nation. That's where we are right now. It is a culture war, and it's divided between people who believe there's truth, there's, there's an absolute truth, there's right and wrong, there's a natural law, there's a God in the universe, uh, and he exists, and he's real, and he has ways for people to live. And those who believe that everything is relative, you know, I mean, if, uh, if you're not hurting anybody today, well, that's fine, and maybe we can evolve more forward, and yeah, that was the way we thought then, but it's not the way we think now, and so it changes and it shifts. And that's the great cultural divide, and that's the great cultural war. And that is the cultural war that sets the future of humanity, and that's the cultural war in which we engage on these issues about when, is, when does life begin and what does it mean now to be a human. We have technology that could be able to shift and adjust for us uh, the very being of, of human existence. And so we're starting to wrestle with those questions. And I think those are on God's heart about what it is to be human. 
Let me go through with you a few of the lead questions that we're debating and uh, discussing now in Washington, just at the very early phases of it. But you need to be involved in this discussion. Number one, <clears throat> is the young human, the embryo, at the very earliest of stages, when the, when the egg and the sperm unite, is the young human a person or is it a piece of property? It is one or the other. In all of our jurisprudence, in all of our legal system, and everything in this country, it's one of those two things. It's either person or property. Everything is. Everything in this room is either a person or it's a piece of property. What is a young human? We know the young human is alive. Is it a life? We know that if you put it in a nurturing environment, at some point in time, by everybody's definition, it becomes alive and a life. By everybody's. So that we know that clearly this is here. Is there some point in time where it transitions from being, from being property to being a person? Does it make the shift from being property at this stage to being a person at another stage? Now, nothing in our human existence here says anything transitions from person to property back and forth. But is that what we're going to treat and do with, with the young human? Person or property? Question of first order. Uh, which is it? And that gets involved in some of the debate we're doing later on that I want to talk about. A second question, should we make other humans in our own image for our own good? Should we make other humans in our own image for our own good? This is the issue in the debate of cloning that's just now starting out and moving uh, in the Congress uh, that I have a, a bill in to address that topic. A third one, should we, should we make humans better? Should we make humans better? This is the idea of the germline manipulation, where you would take a, a, a genetic snippet from some other plant or animal, a chicken, and put it into either the egg or the uh, uh, sperm, uh, and those two united, and then that genetic code is within a human and in the human species that can be passed on down the road. If we do that such, it'll make humans live to be 150 on a regular basis if we find a particular genetic snippet. Uh, can we make everybody be a blonde uh, if they want to be a blonde? I don't know. How many of you want to be a blonde that are not a blonde? Okay. How many of you are blonde that don't want to be a blonde? No, I'll leave it alone. It's a, uh, we, do we want to do that? It brings back and conjures up all the discussions and thoughts of the uh, earlier eugenics movement uh, that was taking place. Those three key issues are being now discussed in our country. Uh, and quickly, how are they being discussed? The number one, is it, is it a person or property, is being discussed in the stem cell research debate that's going on. And I just want to give you a little state of the play that's taking place uh, right now. Uh, we have a number of people in the Congress who want to take young embryos, young humans, some from the in vitro fertilization clinics. Others want to create uh, young humans, the embryos, just for research purposes and development purposes, uh, saying, okay, we have such power in these early cells that can grow and multiply and differentiate and form different types of tissue. Could we mount, make these malleable enough that we could cause them to grow into a kidney for this gentleman here and a heart for this gentleman here and brain cells for this lady here so that when they have various diseases that come upon them that we could, we could fix them. Now that will quickly slide into cloning because the genetic material doesn't match up now. So we would need to take this gentleman, Gill's uh, DNA from a skin cell. We need to take it and put it into a human embryo after we denuclei the human embryo. Take Gill's DNA, put it in here, start it growing again for a period of time, a couple of weeks, harvest, kill it, harvest then the stem cells and grow Gill the liver that he needs. That's what's being talked about. And we've had uh, testimony in Congress about people saying, yes, this is what we need to do. And look at all these diseases we can cure. Look at all these things that we can do with that. Yes, we have to kill one or two lives to do it, but they're not really life because they're property at this stage in human development. Later they're people, but right now they're property. So we'll, let, we'll, just, we'll just do that. And that's, that's being debated now. And will we use even taxpayer money to do this with? That's the issue that's actually in front of us at this point in time. So that involves both the killing of a young human and then also cloning of a new human, one in our own image with our own genetic code so it can build and, and build the spare body parts that we may need to, to be a fountain of youth and to be able to live a longer period of time. 
the germline manipulation I've, I've mentioned to you. There's another topic that's uh, being discussed, uh, some that we're seeing. Jones Institute in Virginia just recently created uh, embryos just for research purposes. Uh, human livestock is the way I look at that. Uh, I mean, this, these are young humans being used in a livestock type of term. They even used the livestock terminology. We wanted robust uh, eggs and sperm that, that could create the, the most lively, strongest uh, of these early, uh, early embryos, early young humans, to be able to harvest those eggs because it would be more vigorous. I come from an agricultural background. That's the way we use and the way we talk about, uh, talk about cattle. Um, I've had uh, conversations with a number of people. I visited with the Vice President today on the flight out about this topic of uh, stem cell research, embryonic stem cell research. And parenthetically, I want to tell you, we, we don't have to go this route. And I am a strong proponent of science and research. I support doubling the National Institute of Health budget. I think we have a lot of possibilities. I think the Human Genome Project was a wonderful thing that we did. We have ethical answers. And right now what we're having to discuss is we need to put a boundary and create a playing field that is an ethical playing field. We can do adult stem cell research. I don't know how many of you have heard about adult stem cells, but each of your bodies and various body parts have stem cells that reproduce other cells. You even have them in your fat. Uh, some of us think we have too many fat stem cells. They're just growing too much around here. And it turns out they can be formed into various functions, and they've been very successful so far in creating real cures so that we do have an ethical, moral route to go that we can fund and support. They've already done cornea stem cell work, where cornea stem cells have been taken out, grown outside, put back in as an operating and functioning cornea in humans. That's taken place already. We're getting in mouse models diabetes cure from adult stem cells. They're far more stable than the embryonic ones. The embryonic ones will move and shake uh, on you a lot, and these will work in the adult route. So we don't have to kill them. What I'm also saying to you, we don't as believers, as Christians, have to say, um, look, I'm just against that, and I know your child has diabetes, and I'm sorry. We don't have to say that. We can say your child has diabetes, and I've got an answer, and I'll support this, and we need to do this. But we don't need to kill another person. At any time in our human existence when we've done this before, and we've done it many times, where we subject one set of humans for the purpose and benefit of another set of humans, we've always regretted it. And we've done it a lot in human history. Most recently, taking place uh, uh, in China, uh, where people were executed and then body parts harvested out of the executed prisoners. And people were just going, oh, I can't stand that. But you can say, well, they were going to die anyway, which is what people say about frozen embryos. Why not get some benefit out of them? Which you get out of prisoners if they've been killed, and you harvest a heart, and it gives somebody else life for a period of time. What's the difference? What's the difference? I mean, I, I, any time we've done this in human history, we've always regretted it, and we will on this one as well. I, uh, when I was visiting this morning about this with the Vice President, he ended our conversation by saying, well, um, this really is about the future of humanity. And it really is about the future of humanity. And we're going to be deciding these questions over the next five to seven years. Uh, you're just going to see these coming litany one after another. I want to beg you to do a couple of things, if you would. Number one, to really pray about this. Uh, this is something that, that we, are, we are holding the future in our hands. Uh, and I really hope that you'll pray about this, that, that hearts will be open to the truth. Uh, that they'll be open to that. I hope a second thing you'll do is declare about it. A lot of people are, are fearful about getting into this battle because they have a friend that has a child that has juvenile diabetes. They have a friend uh, who has Parkinson's or a parent that has Parkinson's or something else. And researchers hold this hope out. We're going to solve all of these problems with this little embryo and it's going to be thrown away anyway. And you sit there and go, I want to help them. And we all do. I just won't say anything. But you need to declare because we, we need to be able to speak out, and we should speak out, and speak out for life. The whole nature of humanity will soon be debated, even as it is now. Third, we need to always speak that and declare that truth in love. Never get away from that. Uh, if I've seen anything that's really taken us the wrong way politically when people of faith have gotten involved in office, it's to speak the truth in hate, or to hate the enemy, or to hate this other person because they're doing this. And that's completely wrong. It's, a, it's against everything of the teachings that were in there, and it doesn't work. 
You can hate people, and you're never going to win them over that way. If you love people, they will come our way. God doesn't ask us to be fishers of men with ugly bait. He gives us beautiful bait, and, and love is it. And it's a beautiful bait that we can lay out there and, and hold with. I, uh, I, I hope you will do those things. And let me just um, conclude uh, by saying that um, this is an enormously important time, and too few people are understanding what all this is about and what it's going to lead to, because we will soon have the debate on cloning, we will soon have the debate on germline manipulation, and that will be setting the template for a number of years, and it will be here and it will be global. But the United States leads in the world, and what we do will have a great deal of say what happens around the world. And I really beg you, pray, declare, speak the truth in love. We need all of that taking place. I look forward to your comments and questions. God bless you all. Well, thank you very much, Senator. Um, I'll make three comments, three reflections, three theological reflections on this debate before we open up for some general uh, questions and discussion. One of the interesting features of the developments of modern science and technology is the way in which it throws fresh light on what Christians believe. People often have the sense that these new developments take us somehow away from what we know about and leave behind the truths of the faith. In fact, it works the other way around. And the fresher the contemporary questions posed by science and technology, um, the sharper the questions we can pose in turn of Holy Scripture and of the teaching of the church as we seek to discover what God has to say to us. And uh, I'm going to offer you three examples that seem to me to fall squarely in that category of the kind of questions that really we didn't formulate a generation ago, but now are plainly crucial questions to ask of Holy Scripture and that shed enormous light on the framework of understanding within which we see these particular questions. Uh, the first, of course, is the... Um, question of the significance of what it means to be human in general. Uh, the question which has been, in fact, so helpfully framed for us by none other than our uh, good, uh, <laughs> good, worthwhile bioethics friend, Peter Singer. <laughs> Peter Singer, who was accretion to Princeton University, <coughs> was a grave embarrassment to Princeton, but I think a huge strategic benefit to us because Peter Singer has a way of saying things that always helps us when he opens his mouth. <laughs> um, thanks to uh, Jennifer Lowell, um, who is Center for Bioethics from the Church out in Oakland, California, is one of the byproducts of our program here. Uh, I'm to be debating Peter Singer next uh, June. And um, he interestingly posed the question he wants to debate, which is that being human is not special. Being human is not significant. It's only advanced intellectual capacities that make us special. He, of course, has coined the term speciesism, which I discovered had entered the language pretty fully two nights ago when I took my 11-year-old daughter, Alice, to see Dr. Doolittle too. That was the first Eddie Murphy film I've actually enjoyed. <laughs> Very clever script, but I mean, he uses the term speciesism. Singer has entered the language. He's focused the question, what does it mean to be human? Genesis chapter 1 gives us the answer. To be homo sapiens is to be imago Dei. Membership in our species is to bear the image of God. Singer is quite right to say the big question is, does being human matter? Where he is, of course, quite wrong is to say that the answer is no. And we, in fact, for special reasons, no, the answer is yes. There are other ways you can argue this. The human race has to be indivisible in its dignity. Human dignity cannot be divided up by any criterion unless you want to land yourself in all the great trials and crises of history, which have almost always depended upon an ideology which does just that. And of course, most recently, Roe v. Wade did just that. 
divided up the human species into two groups. Genesis chapter 1 teaches us to be made in the image of God is to bear the very dignity of God himself. To use the phrase that I am rather daringly coined, that we have been made space-time models of God. And the we, of course, Genesis chapter 1 makes it very plain, is humankind. Not some humans rather than others, men rather than women. Those are one race, religious people, good people, all those who are of the human stock. And of course, as uh, Genetics 101 teaches us, uh, the story begins at the beginning. And you are never more or less a human being, a member of Homo sapiens. Your the taxonomist will always decide. You are this species, not that species. And if you are our species, you are, if you like, God's species. You are made after his kind in his likeness, in his image. And half the bioethics agenda is all about that question. And to that half of the agenda, we have the simplest possible answer. Yes, to bear the divine image is what makes us human. And you want to ask a geneticist to identify the species in which this particular creature is to be found. And if it is our species, game, set, and match. That's a British sporting term. <laughs> <laughs> to be human is to bear the divine image, to be on our side of this divide. And we are all brothers and sisters in this human family, from the greatest to the very, very least. Whoso does this to one of the least of my brothers, said somebody, hath done it to me. Secondly, if we pose the question more forcibly and we ask the question which was only begun to be asked since 1979, Louise Brown, the world's first test tube baby, a uh, little story here, I <laughs> was with a group of uh, congressmen and some others at a meeting with Secretary Thompson early on in this debate about, um, about stem cells and I was able to make a little speech and uh, I felt I <laughs> had no other way to begin than by offering an apology on behalf of my former nation for having invented both in vitro uh, and cloning, these being two thoroughly British inventions bestowed upon the world, and thereby creating so many problems for the secretary. That was meant to be amusing. I don't think he found it very funny either. <laughs> but secondly, if we ask the question, can it really be that from the very beginning this is true? The answer, of course, lies in, if you like, the second most characteristic Christian doctrine after the doctrine of creation, in the doctrine of incarnation. Because if you say, can this really be this tiny speck, this <laughs> pre-embryo, as they have tried to call it, this embryo-like entity, as I gather, uh, it is now, now being called by some, can this really be one of us? Well, of course, the geneticist will say yes. If you have a chimpanzee embryo, it is a chimpanzee, that is the species, um, I, in my book, The New Medicine, uh, I, I raised the question, um, I said, I'm probably the first person in the history of the universe to say, what kind of being is a chimpanzee embryo? <laughs> because it's an analytical question. It's a chimpanzee kind of being. So why do we have the question, what kind of being is a human embryo? Uh, <laughs> if we ask the question, of course, then it is interesting. It is, I, it is of course, wryly amusing the way in which the Lord answers our questions. Um, because he said, well, the purpose of the Incarnation was not to teach you how to do your bioethics, but, yes, the Incarnation took place um, in embryo. Our Lord was a zygote. God took the form of a zygote. Just as you were a zygote and I was a zygote, so was Jesus. And in a way which really, you know, <laughs> who sits in the heavens laughs. Uh, <laughs> This, this really is rather plain when you begin to think about it. The incarnation took place not uh, at Bethlehem when the baby was born. That was a wonderful event, the, the manifestation of our Lord. The incarnation took place with the annunciation uh, to Mary that the child that she would bear would be called Jesus. That was when God became man. Thirdly, 
looking forward. Here we address, if you like, the terms of these debates, which the Senator outlined for us, stem cell cloning questions. You begin to look forward to uh, the question of germline interventions. Um, I shared with one or two of you a little while ago that I was writing a paper on this stuff, and I used the spell check. I, I actually spell rather well, but I, I used the spell check to make sure I spell American rather than British. Uh, you may know that uh, British people spell things differently. From an American point of view, Americans spell things wrong from a British point of view. And, and you, can get, you can get caught in the middle rather easily. So I, I ran the spell check, and I used the term germline therapy. And uh, Bill Gates hadn't heard the word germline, because he hadn't heard it then. And uh, so it came back with a suggestion. Perhaps gremlin was the word I wanted. <laughs> That's good. That's a this good is, irony. This is a true story. <laughs> a gremlin. What is the theological issue here? Well, let me just give you one. People say, this, I don't like this idea, but you know, what's really wrong with improving the stock in this radical way, rebuilding the species? creating the post-human species. This is the term being used. Well, one of the most neglected Christian doctrines is that of the exalted and glorified humanity of Christ. That as Charles Hodge, whom some of you will know was the dullest, as well as the most orthodox of 19th century theologians, um, obviously most of you don't know, <laughs> but if you have insomnia, I recommend Charles Hodge. Um, <laughs> Charles Hodge of Princeton, in happier days at Princeton, he wrote, the one who sits upon the throne of the universe is both perfect man and perfect God. The humanity of Christ was not simply an occasion for Palestine. It began in Mary's conception, in this miraculous act of human beginnings. It has not ended. The genetic structure of human being, glorified, transformed in ways we can barely begin to understand, is preserved in glory. And our Lord himself, having taken our humanity to himself, has not laid it down and shall not. The significance of this doctrine for our conviction that Homo sapiens is the way to go that this is the nature in which God has made us is in fact enormous and suggests that those who might argue otherwise are not trinkering at the sort of edges of human improvement but are guilty of a fundamental uh, heretical reading um, of uh, our understanding of what it means to be one of us. I offer those as the theological reflections, fresh ways in which theology suddenly becomes significant when you raise the new issues. And we may yet believe that the same kind of... Uh, dynamic relevancy will be found as yet new questions are raised in the agenda to come. Final comment. As Senator Brownback began by speaking about the enormous significance of this discussion. It could be said that at the heart of every culture lies its definition, its vision of what it means to be human. And to the extent that cultural change is revolutionary in character, it is, to that extent, a redefinition, a struggle to redefine what it means to be one of us. This seems to me to be a truism of all cultures. At the time of this, the greatest cultural revolution in the history of the world, when the structures of Judeo-Christian civilization and our exalted, not perfect, but exalted view of human nature, which, of course, have lain at the heart of Western culture, and most recently of the flowering of Western democracy, there is this redefinition of what it means to be one of us. This is the one thing that brings together every issue in public policy, every issue in cultural change, all the things that concern us. They come together at this point. Bioethics, they come together most clearly, most candidly, and most corrosively. Because in bioethics, as it were, you have on the, on the bench in the lab human being, both in fact and in symbol. And human being is being reshaped in the hands, on the one hand, of the scientists and technologists, yet more significantly in the hands of those who pander, 
to the demands of biotechnology by doing bioethics at its bidding. We are reshaping human dignity. And if there's one clear cultural mandate for every believer today, it is to determine that the dignity of this species, flawed and fallen as we are, is the dignity of the species God made as the high point of creation, and he has taken into the very Godhead to be his own. This is where we shall take our stand, draw our line in the sand, there will be no post-human species if the people of God have anything to do with it. Because just as, to use a tagline that uh, I have uh, been marketing over the last four years, every child has the right not to be born a clone, every human child has the right to the wholly human nature in which the child of Bethlehem and Nazareth was born, and which he has now made eternal, glorified, for our sake, on the right hand of God. Now we have time for your questions to uh, Senator Brownback, and uh, please, we have uh, two microphones here, please no speeches, I will cut off speeches quite rudely, um, make some questions or short comments, say first of all who you are, um, and Senator Brownback will, um, I trust, be very pleased to respond. Let's give Nigel a round of applause. That was beautiful. Thank you. And if, if you'd like to ask him questions too, please uh, have it that as well. Hi, I'm Carrie Gordon Earl from Focus on the Family, and we just want to say how much we appreciate you and the stand you take, that the courageous voice that you've been on this issue, and I appreciate that. Um, those of us in this room understand the watershed moment that George W. Bush has before him yeah. with the embryonic stem cell decision. We understand the cloning, the germline therapies, and where it's going. Do you have any indication that President Bush understands what this, what this could open, what it could mean to us? Yes. I, I mean, I, um, I have not talked directly with the President about, about this. I'm hopeful of getting a meeting uh, when he gets back uh, from this Europe. European trip with him directly. I spoke directly to the Vice President this morning about it. He says the President knows this issue very well. Uh, he has invested a lot of time, and the Vice President is saying too, you know, I, I think I know this man pretty well. He's, uh, he normally looks at some, says we're going this way, and that's, that's it. I mean, he just, it's a quick decision, Texas style, you pull the guns, you start shooting. <laughs> he, uh, you know, shoot first, sort out the dead later, you know, is a kind of little, We'll, we'll do it that way. But he says on this one, he is talking to lots of people about it. And he knows that this is a very important issue and how it, uh, how it resolves. And as the Vice President himself said this morning, he said this is about the future of humanity. Uh, so they are all over this in a discussion uh, in many aspects of it and hearing from uh, lots of different sides. I think his real struggle is, is the scientists are, are, are truly promising the moon on this. We're going to cure lupus. We're going to cure ALS. We're going to cure spinal cord injuries. We're going to cure Parkinson's. We're going to cure juvenile diabetes. And my argument to the Vice President this morning was, we have bought this pony before. We bought it in the fetal tissue research debate nine years ago. Some of you may have remembered this debate nine years ago. We we're going to take fetal tissue out of young humans that were aborted, and, and we we're going to take this tissue and put it into older people, and voila, we're going to have a veritable fountain of youth. Uh, what, what do we have after nine years of fetal tissue? What do we have? Nothing. Nothing. Well, we have a Parkinson's disease study that went terribly wrong. Yeah, I gave that article <laughs> yeah. to the Vice President this morning on this Parkinson's study, the, the one standardized one that they did where they put fetal tissue, brain tissue cells in Parkinson's patient. Scientists said disastrous results, uncontrollable writhing, you couldn't reverse it, uh, just horrible. Where are the mouse models? or the primate models on embryonic stem cell. We always start out with animals. So you test it in mice, then you go primates, and then humans. Where's the mouse model? We've known about mouse embryonic stem cells for 20 years. Okay, we ought to, we ought to have some models here of kidneys or, or something. What do we have? Again, we don't have anything. 
So, but the promise remains, and a number of these, uh, the, the disease groups are really very aggressive on this and saying that this is, you're killing my daughter if you don't let this research take place. You're killing my, my, uh, uh, my mother. Uh, so it's, uh, I think he really struggled with it because he wants, it's compassion, he wants to help people. But I, I don't know when he decides and, and I don't know uh, how it comes. I'm, I'm uh, hopeful and I hope people are praying for him. Thank you. David Stevens. Yeah, I'm Dr. David Stevens, Executive Director of the Christian Medical Association. It's good to see you and I want to thank you as well for your moral statesmanship, something that's in short supply and uh, we appreciate it. My. You're a politician, so you understand politics a lot better than we do. One of the things that really is difficult uh, for me to understand, I know many others, is why there's been so many of the Republican Party that have uh, jumped off the boat on this, where oftentimes the Democrats walk so lockstep on uh, abortion issue. And second question is this, what do you think the uh, chances or potentials politically are that Congress is going to come up and uh, pass a bill on this, no matter what the president does. Um, you answers your question. First, uh, thank you for your comment. I, I would note to you that in, in human history, uh, great nations are first good nations. Yeah. Good people make great nations. And when you lose the goodness, you're going to lose your greatness uh, eventually. It's, you, you have some human capital that's built up there for a period of time you can live on. but. Um, this is a fundamental concern. If we lose the goodness, we lose the greatness of the nation. Um, you know, on, on why people have, uh, have um, uh, slid off, I can only speculate for uh, some, uh, some reasons. A number of disease groups lobby very actively, and they come in. I met with uh, mothers from Kansas who had juvenile diabetes daughters uh, that were there and were in essence were saying to me, you are killing my daughter by not letting this go forward. I believe me, that's a very uncomfortable position for somebody to be in. Mm -hmm. If you can somehow try to figure a, an argument around to say, well, okay, it's just an embryo, they're frozen, they're gonna be destroyed anyway. Yeah, I don't, I don't like it, but can I figure some way to do this? Okay, let's try to find a new definition. I agree that life begins at conception, but that's conception in the womb. Uh, so I'll differentiate, which is all a differentiation based on geography. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a child in the womb, but it's not if it's outside. Uh, well, that's opposite of what we're doing now. We're saying it's a child if it's outside, but not if it's inside the womb. Uh, <laughs> and so it, that one doesn't uh, hold water. I think there's also a desire to, to show in some senses an independence uh, from some people from the pro-life movement saying, well, the press is always hammering on us about being so beholden to the pro-life movement, so therefore this, I'm, I'll show some independence from that and therefore they can't say that. You know, the problem with that is, is I'm with the pro-life movement because I'm pro-life. Not because they're a political force, I like that, I hope you stay very active, that means a lot and it's very important in a political battlefield, but um, it, it makes it look like it's all a political calculation then uh, as to why, why people are pro-life. Um, and so that, that's why I think, I mean, it's been very detrimental. I think it'll end up at the end of the day being the most detrimental to the people who moved off who were pro-life. Because it'll make it seem like this was, they were, they were pro-life when it was uh, needed, but they really don't believe it. Um, what will Congress do? We, we're hemorrhaging on votes in the Senate on this with, with people shucking off as they have that have been traditional, strong pro-life voices and going the other way is really hurt. I've got some people uh, that are coming back uh, on, but we, we do not have the votes to block it uh, in the Senate. The House, we might win the fight uh, on the embryonic stem cell uh, research, and then it'll be, it'll be dependent upon what the President does. If the President says, I will support it in a limited fashion, limited set uh, sort of way, uh, you know, I think we probably lose the whole thing yeah. uh, at, at that. Point. And so it's very important which way he goes. Remember, this is step one, though. That's the embryonic stem cell, the taxpayer funding of embryonic stem cell research. That's, that's debate one. The next one, quickly, that follows on is cloning. Because what you're really going to have to do if the researchers get their way what they want is you're going to have to clone young humans first and then get stem cells that genetically match this gentleman. 
match day. That's where we're going to go. So I wouldn't doubt that if they go with taxpayer funding, they'll push aggressively a ban on cloning as to try to split the issue and so make some people happy and, and work it that way. Uh, and that may get, get thrown in there as well. Thank you. Thanks for the question. If, in that vein, if I can just pose a, uh, another question. Let's say there is a ban. Let's say there are political roadblocks. What is to prevent private laboratories, rogue laboratories? What is to provide the, the ambitious and the uh, research, uh, the guild? What is to prevent it from being uh, enacted anyway, even if there are political roadblocks? Let's uh, say you are successful mm -hmm. in mounting political opposition to it. What to is the, to, to the taxpayer funding? Yes, yes. Yeah. What is to prevent it from being uh, done anyway in the research community, Nothing. even if uh, federal funds are detached? There's nothing to prevent it right now. Yeah. It's taking place right now. Human embryonic research is taking place right now. So there's nothing there to prevent it. All, well, the fight today is about taxpayer funding, which is the government stamp of approval saying, OK, this is, this is fine to do. And that's the only, we're not, we're not even fighting about banning it. Uh, now, there will be a fight coming about creating embryos just for research purposes. In other words, creating life with an express purpose not to let it live. Uh, and there are efforts to, to ban that in, across the country. Uh, and plus, I want to say that if we, let's say we're successful in the United States. I met with European parliamentarians this week, people talking about doing this in Europe. And actually, as we discussed at dinner tonight, the, the Germans are the best probably on this for as far as the most ethical viewpoint that they've taken, partially because of the background and their own experiences. So this will have to be on a global negotiated basis eventually. Yeah, I, just, I have one line. I've been going around using the line, uh, the cute line, let the German conscience be your guide. <laughs> it's very, with a little whistle. <laughs> Scott. Senator Brownback, I'm Scott Daniels. Um, I do remember the fetal tissue debate firsthand because I staffed Orrin Hatch on that and created the fetal tissue banks. Yeah. The question I have is, does anybody make the argument uh, that the science isn't effective or proven to be effective? There seems to be a very strong ethical problem with uh, exaggerating or hyping the hopes and aspirations of those within the disease community that will put their confidence in this short of having the science to actually bring about a therapy that will actually touch their lives. So it seems fundamentally unethical of what the disease lobbyists are doing or what they need to do to make this, to get it to a, a political pitch that it has to be to create the kind of political pressure to push this through. Um, I'm making that argument with my colleagues. Uh, and some people, and some of the scientific communities pointed out, but we just had the NIH uh, quick study out this week, and they're, they're all selling the potential. It's, it's kind of selling the, the hype of it that, well, no, we don't have anything yet, but we could cure, and then you list all the diseases because of the enormous potential of these cells to grow and to differentiate and to make multiple different types of cells. So there's look great potential with it, and that's what's being hyped and sold, even though they have, they have nothing of products mm -hmm. or results. And, you know, we're, we're a very susceptible nation to that, the, uh, the dot-com uh, explosion across the, we were going to, everybody was going to uh, go and all, everything was going to be done over the internet and we put billions of dollars into these companies that didn't have any product, weren't selling anything, had no, we're making nothing, but they're going to, you know, we, we're going to get it in the future. Right. Uh, or, One observation for you, Nigel, um, when you're talking about reshaping human beings, um, I'm not sure I'm entirely comfortable with that description because it seems to me that um, you know, God has made his creation in a way that we can't unscrew the inscrutable. Now, human hubris being what it is, we'll try, and of course that's where the damage will come in. But as far as ever achieving the goal of creating or reproducing scientifically, it seems to me like that theologically isn't a possibility, and I wanted you to comment on that. This basically is a, a new a retread of the God of the Gaps argument, Scott. The God of the gaps argument, you know, the stuff that God won't, you know, the, the, you're, you're, say, you're saying that God won't let it happen. 
You're uh, saying that we won't, we won't produce, for example, a sort of human chimpanzee chimera. It, it's my, well, it's my understanding that, that, that the act of creation is such is that man won't replicate that in its fullness. No matter, we may think we can do that, that's our hubris, uh, but that we won't achieve that. Uh, we may think we can reshape or recreate human beings, um, but we, won't, we will not achieve that because there's something in the mystery of that creation that is beyond the ability of the human mind to, to replicate. And I, I, think, I think it's important that we, aren't, that re, we realize we are not speaking about our, as it were, de novo, you know, creating some new species from the dust of the ground. What we're talking about is, of course, our, our taking in the existing stock uh, and, and splicing and so on. So now I, I don't think that we will be in the position that what is interesting, of course, is the immense ignorance we have I and mean, the limited character of our knowledge here, I mean, all these trillions of all this stuff, you know. Um, and yet, I think in a limited sense, um, we have every reason to believe that there will be either some kind of seriously germline changed creature who is partly human and partly improved, or that there will be some kind of robotic, semi-human entity within the course of the next one or two generations. I mean, this is what the guy from the trade is saying they expect. And I don't see any reason to believe God will prevent us from that experience any more than he prevented us from the Holocaust. Are you disagreeing? It's not. I'm not sure we're exactly communicating. It's not exactly what God will prevent us from doing. It, it, uh, we will tamper and play with, as human beings to the extent that we can. The point is we're not going to achieve that. We will declare ourselves as having achieved it or something close to it or in a research project that we must continue on. It's not that I'm saying that God will stop us. It's just that, that uh, in, our hum in our hubris, we think that we can actually achieve that goal of creating this human entity. What I'm saying is, is I thought that it was part of the doctrine of creation, theologically, that there, there is enough mystery there that we can't really unscrute that inscrutable. Our damage will be in the process as human beings, as we'll tinker and play. We don't know what we'll end up with. We'll call it human beings, perhaps, uh, unless there's some negative connotation with doing that that Peter Sanger, but we will not actually achieve that goal. So it's not, a, it's not the issue of God stepping in. It's a matter of us not really being able to, to, to have the knowledge ever to be able to make that reconstruction. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. I had a question Please for the senator. Name, name. Uh, my name is Catherine Andreg. I'm a pathologist from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, my question is, why is there such a silence about the potential of adult stem cell research? In the last few weeks, I've read at least four things in public magazines uh, USA Today, that sort of thing, where stem cell research was discussed and adult stem cells were never even mentioned. They, uh, <clears throat> I think there's a couple of things that are behind that. Uh, number one is uh, it's, a, it's a real answer uh, to these disease problems, but it takes you away from the embryonic uh, stem cell. The, uh, and that's where the scientists really want to take because they can grow these, they can grow them fast, uh, and they think they're going to be able to mold them into a lot of different things. Um, some think it's a canard, that uh, the adult stem cells is just uh, us trying to divert attention from the embryonic, where the, where the real fight should be. I mean, that was even in New York Times this week, or one of the big papers were saying, that the NIH study was saying, well, there's great potential and uh, uh, great work possible in both the embryonic and the adult, uh, but they're different. And they were saying, well, this just shows that the adult is a canard. It's just a red herring that we're trying to take, uh, take people down. Uh, we, uh, I've been pushing the adult for two years, uh, and we just keep finding more and more that's happening there that's really working in the adult. Uh, and the other side doesn't like it because it's a legitimate answer uh, to it. And they, they don't want that because they want to have the clear definition of either you're for embryonic stem cell research or you're for these people dying early of juvenile diabetes or not curing people with spinal cord injuries or Mary Tyler Moore or Michael J. Fox. You just want them to suffer. They want the clarity of that and, and to put it that way uh, because, you know, it makes for 
Yeah, better story, and it, and it makes you seem darker and more hideous in how little you care for people. I don't know. I, I mean, I kept thinking, two years ago when we started this fight, we didn't have much of anything in the adult stem cell area. This, all this in the adult stem cells happened over virtually the last two years. And so I'm, you know, I'm at a point in time here now with this debate where I'm going, look, we were winning the scientific fight on this in a big way. The science is coming big on the adult, and there's nothing on the embryonic. And yet we keep losing this policy bait just because it seemed like we want to rush to spill blood. We just really want to, we just really want to do this. I don't know. I, I don't understand that one. Let me just add one comment. I mean, I think plainly what is going on here partly is that the biotech industry, they've drawn their line in the sand. You know? Yeah, they want this. They want, they, want, they want absolutely no regulation whatever. Even in the context of human reproductive cloning, yeah, their alone. policy has been, let's have a voluntary moratorium. Or at worst, a statutory moratorium. I mean, they basically want our hands off. Public yeah. policy, and it's ironic. I had an interesting discussion with their, their lobbyist about this, and I said to him, look, the only way you're going to make money is if, you know, you've got to secure long-term stockholder value in your companies. And if you look at what happened in Europe in the matter of uh, genetically modified food, where there's been this peasant's revolt, you know, right across Europe, every little supermarket, uh, you know, mom and pop store, restaurant, notice in the window, we don't sell GM food. Huge for all sorts of reasons, good and bad reasons, huge reaction, which is a great hit taken by some of the, by Monsanto and some others. Now, the point is, unless there's public confidence, which you actually have to put in the form of public policy and a regulated regime, long term, they're not even going to make money if they're going to face the kind of reversal. I mean, and this is the sort of argument I think that you know, some of us have been using with them. But their present policy is that they want absolutely no regulation of what they do. Yeah, I think it's a very short-sighted policy. On, on embryonic, on cloning, on germline manipulation, they, they fight me on all three of those. They want, don't want any limitations on any of it. I also want to say here, though, that I think uh, Nigel's put his finger on something as well that we're starting to work on. This needs to be, a, <coughs> politically, a right-left coalition. A lot of people on the right that are opposed to this. There are a number of people on the far left that are opposed to this. Uh, and we really need to reach out, and that's what we're doing, building right now, is that right-left coalition uh, with us on this. And with that, we can, we can win, but we can't if we just say, eh, I never deal with those folks because they're goofy on you know, this or whatever we might, might say. No, this is a, this is a, we've got to build this in a big right-left coalition. I hope you will in your work and in your communities, too. Yeah, it means, means making friends with some people who you haven't normally been friends with. But this, but this you know, this very... I'll just tell you one, one little story. I mean, one, one of the hearings on, 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 on the bill, quite extraordinary. Some of you will know the name of a woman called Judy Norsegian, who was the current editor of this famous feminist text, Our Bodies, Ourselves. And she testified in support of the bill. And banning, she, of banning. Of banning, Clone. banning, human cloning, banning, embryo cloning. She has a letter out, which has now been signed by scores of feminist pro-choice leaders asking for a five-year moratorium on embryo cloning and a ban on reproductive cloning. But she testified basically in favor of the bill, and she said that the pro-choice, the, 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 the biotech industry you know, were abusing the women's movement and the pro-choice cause by using them to try and argue that this was abortion. She said, because you haven't got a conflict of interest, conflict of rights, so you haven't got a mother. Um, what you have here basically is the abuse of the, of, this, of, of, of the human embryo. And so she said, and she and Richard Dorflinger from the Catholic bishops were side by side. It's a fascinating piece of sort of body language. And they were agreeing. They said that, you know, Richard Dorflinger said, yes, the pro-choice movement does not claim the embryo is nothing. And she said, no, the embryo is not nothing. It's success, I guess. It's not nothing. It's better. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get a meeting with uh, Ralph Nader. Uh, because a number of people in that group are, are very opposed to this sort of uh, modification. So we're going we're gonna to build it. We passed a bill last year against sex trafficking, the trafficking in humans for prostitution purposes. We were able to get it through. Paul Wellstone and I uh, did that. And we had Chuck Colson and Gloria Steinem uh, both in the same letter. Uh, uh, yeah, well, you know, people, act, people really wake up and they see that and they say, what do these two agree on? This must really be good. And that's what we ought to get on this one.
really is that sort of thing. And instead of saying we always govern from the middle, let's let's pull it from from either side of this, and and we'll push the middle on through. Yeah. Good evening, Senator Brownback, David Pauls, Manhattan, Kansas. Go hey. K State. So All right. anyway. <laughs> uh, I have a comment for you. I think part of the declaring does mean writing to our congressmen and our senators, and, I th and those of us as Christians sometimes don't want to dirty our hands in the political process, but those letters and those comments and telephone calls do have some impact. They do. And as you, you know, as you bring more and more people together, they have more impact. And I have a question for you, Dr. Cameron. Last year when we were talking about the future, people were bringing up the, the, the whole story about the Tower of Babel. I mean, is this something... Is that something that integrates here, where the people are essentially we're trying to do the same thing? We will be like God, and God came and, you know, took care of that. Well, I'll first of all respond to the dirtying hands because I, you know, I've, got, I've got a soundbite here for you. Um, whenever people say that, you say, "No, no, you are cleansing your hands," because your hands get dirty when you are not involved in the shaping of public policy. This is how you cleanse your hands by. You know, delivering yourself of your responsibilities. You've got to turn around this whole way of thinking on the part of Christians. I mean, we believe God is still the creator, and that means we've got to get involved in public process. Um, Babel is very interesting, um, and uh, what is fascinating here, if those who look at the literature, is there have been a series of books come out in this field from the liberals, which have been picking up on the biblical imagery. For example, the most significant is Lee Silver's book, Remaking Eden. And if you are into this stuff, you should read Silver's book, Professor Biology of Princeton, a fascinating book, full of great chunks of Bible. I mean, he just quotes, you know, verses and verses and verses for all sorts of, you know, elusive purposes. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the whole significance for the Tower of, Tower of Babel, I mean, here we have this, this great ancient attempt, you know, to declare autonomy. And, and God finally, you know, despoils it and makes it a lot more difficult for human beings ever again to be quite so arrogant. And I think, you know, you can, you can of course, read these things in interesting ways. And maybe, maybe it will be, I mean, that, that got one way that, that we will be on the verge of creating this post-human species. And some microbe or some bot will get out, you know, and take civilization back a thousand years. I mean, who knows? Um, <laughs> this is how you build your church, but how you build a cult. I mean, you can... <laughs> by letting loose with these interpretations without saying, well, it could be. Um, but it seems to me, yet yeah, the principle of Babel is that you know, we have a way of overreaching ourselves, and God has a way of putting us down. <clears throat> Do you want to comment? What's that? Do you want to comment on Babel? I, I think you covered it well. <laughs> <laughs> I babble enough. I, I probably... Hi, my name is Morse Tan. I'm with the healthcare law and policy department of Ross and Hardy's law firm. And I really appreciate the moral courage and leadership that both of you evince. And the question I had was this. In order to make some of these, even legislative victories, stick, the judiciary has to be um, in place in such a way that it doesn't strike down such things. My understanding is that, well, I was interested in getting your perspective on what the present situation is with the uh, Bush nominations. Uh, that have not yet been moved on in the U.S. Senate and what your perspective is on the situation there. The uh, Bush nominations, we, we got three judges uh, through today. Uh, one circuit court, two uh, federal district courts. Those are the first Bush nominees to uh, come forward, all non-controversial. Uh, many of them have been held up a great deal. Uh, there's lots of uh, uh, positioning uh, on this because uh, a lot of times the left doesn't want a uh, more um, uh, stricter view of the Constitution. If a Supreme Court nomination position comes open, it will be a mega battle. There's many of these cases lately that the court's been involved in, the controversial ones, they've been social issues, social policy. Many of them have been decided 5-4, five, 4-5, four, four, five, as, you, as you know. So one vote on that Supreme Court flip, could flip a lot of our, um, our social policy. Um, I don't know if some way for position is going to come open. It may not now, maybe a, a couple years on down the road. But we're starting to get a couple of judges through. None of them are, are uh, much of a difference in ideology from what we've had. Uh, but we will be having some, some judicial battles. I want to point out to you one thing, though, too. In, in some of these cases, uh, <clears throat> you can, you can uh, win losing. 
Uh, the partial birth abortion case is one I'd, I'd put in front of you, and I don't know that we're really in a similar model hill, but partial birth abortion, we've been in that fight for years now. We went and passed it to Congress, vetoed by the President. State legislators passed it, Supreme Court uh, turned it down. That has been a great thing that it's happened that way. Uh, and I voted for it every time I wanted to pass, but if we had passed it the first year and got it through, the president let it become law or signed it in the dark of night, didn't like it, but just get it on past him, we would have limited 1,000 abortions, let's say 2,000 abortions a year that were done by this particular procedure, maybe 5,000, let's go at the top end of it. By this protracted public debate, the number of people that are pro-life in America has moved up substantially. For the first time since Roe versus Wade, there's been a substantial movement up in the number of people pro-life because, because of the protracted debate, the fight, the legislative, the court battle, people had to stare and look at this and say, okay, is this a baby or isn't it? And most of them said, this, this is a baby. And I don't like killing babies. I don't agree with killing babies. Before, it was a blob of tissue, it was something, it was, it was an appendage, I mean, whatever, they, they didn't, most of them just didn't want to face it. But in this one, they had to look at it, and at the end, they said it's a life. This is a person. And the pro-life numbers have gone up dramatically. The number of abortions have gone down, not near enough, but they have gone down. And we've won by losing, by this big fight. Now, will that take place on this? Uh, on it. I don't know that that's, that's particularly parallel. I think what we're having right now when we're having this debate about what is the young human that's in a, uh, that's in a test tube, is it a person or a piece of property, is a wonderful debate because we're finally discussing when does humanity begin? When is, and it's not in a separate apart from the woman's right to choose. It's not in a woman. This is outside. So now we've got to deal with actually what is this? What is it? And we haven't had that debate in decades. So it, I think there's some positive that, that come, out of, come out of the fight. God sows his seeds in a whirlwind. Uh, that's how things are, that's how he does things. It's when there's a big, big roll going. Thanks. Uh, Senator Daniel McConkie with the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity. Um, oftentimes when we address any of these issues we have, you know, the Congress has basically two things it has to consider. One, whether to allow a uh, particular uh, thing to happen at all, and then secondly, whether taxpayer money should be used for it. Um, I, I think we all well know that if uh, a, uh, uh, a law banning embryonic stem cell research went up in before Congress, it, would, it wouldn't pass, uh, let alone we're having this debate over taxpayer funding. What do you see as the future on some of these other issues that you see coming down the pike, uh, cloning, germline things? Uh, do you think that we're gonna be able to address these things um, while, as uh, some people call it, still the yuck factor is still in place before people warm to these ideas and think that they might be acceptable. Uh, are you, do you think that we're going to be able to address that? And part of the reason I ask is, um, in addressing a, a completely different issue, but on uh, the assisted suicide debate now in Oregon, where it is legal, uh, you now have Medicaid, uh, or is it, yeah, Medicaid, which now has limited palliative care. Uh, reimbursements to a thousand dollars but they will pay for your suicide so we once something gets passed we do run into you know then you know the uh, the taxpayer funding issues become you know something of a much bigger animal that we need to address yeah well, it does uh, uh, we're in trouble in the taxpayer uh, uh, funding of embryonic stem cell research in the Senate we would we would lose that vote big if the vote were taking place today uh, in the House, we might still win it, and if the President will side with us, he can veto it. We could, we could stop it from happening. Plus, there's a lawsuit that Sam Casey's got that uh, right now is holding the whole thing up, so we may end up uh, getting it through the courts. Cloning, human cloning, we can get a ban on reproductive cloning. Uh, the therapeutic or the destructive cloning uh, is where there's, where there's division. We could get it through the House. Uh, that, I don't, I don't know that right now we could win it in the Senate. Uh, it would, uh, I'm doubtful that we could win that. Germline manipulation, I think at this point in time, if we could get it up, we could win the whole thing uh, all the way through. But it's going to take a, uh, a campaign, and we've got to somehow get it up on the floor. Uh, the uh, Democrats control the floor now. Uh, it's, 
it's tougher to get these, uh, these issues up for consideration. Maybe we can trade it uh, for something else that they want, but we can get this one up and through. Uh, and, but that's now, while the yuck factor is still there. Now, if, that, if people start warming to these ideas, uh, that could change pretty rapidly, particularly if people say now, and here's where the argument will go on germline manipulation. Uh, okay, now we can prevent Down syndrome children. We can take this particular snippet out and put this one in. Or we're going to be able to deal with this hereditary disease. Or we're going to be able to do this and, and you'll be able to regularly live to be 120, 150 uh, with this. There will be a lot of people that's going to appeal to. But then it begs its own question. What, what is a defective human? You know, is there such a thing? I mean, all created differently. Uh, on it. And <clears throat> I've, I've seen some very beautiful people that, that others would, would look at and, and say, gosh, isn't that terrible what their existence is and what problem they're going through? And many of them, beautiful, a, a beautiful soul that's there. Um, we'll, we'll end up getting into that debate then, too. David Smith, Little Rock. The uh, businessman back home is always uh, looking at the economy and saying that this is a big deal, that if we run it off from the United States, it's going to be happening someplace else. Is there anything legitimate about that argument? On this one, uh, as I mentioned, I think uh, this is going to be a global debate. I mean, we may do something here, uh, but it'll have to go, and it will go global. I met with a group of European parliamentarians uh, this week. Uh, you know, they view it the same way. If they run it out of Europe, they run it out of Germany, it'll go to somewhere else. So that it'll ultimately need some sort of uh, probably a global uh, treaty on it. But don't, don't discount the status of the United States. Uh, this is the leading country of the world. And we, we occupy a position in the world that probably, I don't think you can find a parallel in human history of where we are today, of the strength and the stature that the United States has. We are the lone superpower. We're the largest economy by long distance. We're the largest and strongest military by some distance. Our culture, for good or for ill, dominates the world. Uh, what we do on this will set the template for much of the rest of the world uh, on it. So this is critically important what happens here. Um, Nancy Jones, Wake Forest University School of Medicine. Um, I wanted to ask the germ line, which I'm really glad you're looking for, but can you give us um, specific methods of prayer, or since you're in the trenches, you might know more effective strategies of prayer, like how we as a cohesive group could pray together. Boy, that's a great, thank you for asking that. Um, about a year and a half ago, I was, uh, I was reading some, uh, some of the first books on intercessory prayer, and they were talking about getting people really focused on specific prayer, and I go, of course, why don't I do that? So a guy uh, volunteered uh, for me to, uh, uh, he runs an email uh, notification to people about issues that are coming up. And then people that have signed up or asked to be on that list, we email them out uh, weekly about, okay, here's where this bill is, pray for this senator to look at it this way. And I've had fabulous results happen through that by people being very specific and focused and timely uh, on their prayer. Um, and you can give me your card if you want, and we can put you, uh, uh, you on that list. And you know, as I listed the three things I asked you to do, pray was the first one. It's got to happen in heaven before it happens here. I mean, we, people really have to pray. The, the Puritans, uh, in their first battles uh, here, when they were fighting to really tame the land, the soldiers, when they would go out in the Indian Wars, would tell the people, if you pray, we'll fight. You know, and that's, that's the way I feel a lot of times. If you'll pray, I'll fight. If you don't, I can't. Because it's just, it's, it's not going to happen. I mean, it, God wants us to ask. And he wants us to be specific. And I'm convinced he does that because it builds our faith up then. That we, we see the specific request and the answer and it, and it grows us in our faith. Um, there are other groups in, uh, uh, that run out of Washington that run different um, uh, prayer lists that are pretty timely and up-to-date, and uh, uh, I'm trying to think how I could get you in touch with, with some of those. Um, actually, maybe if I just get your card afterwards, I can get that to this gentleman and can get that, that for you, but 
please, please do, and pray, pray specifically on these items. It really is what we have to do at a first order. Our last question. Uh, Mike Peel, currently from Peoria, Illinois, former Kansan. Uh, thank you for your representation of our state. Appreciate that. With regard, if, if we lose this battle with regards to federal funding, is it possible then to move, uh, and I know it's always easier to take care of things at the federal level because it's a blanket policy, but is it then possible to move to a state by state to try to prevent or control some of these uh, uh, things and at least start that across the country? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, as you recall on partial birth abortion, it went federal and it went to the states and some states banned it. And that's, that was all really part of building the public awareness uh, on the uh, campaign. And on this one, though, actually you could do some of the banning at uh, and should on a state-by-state -state basis. I would hope this next legislative session in a number of states where most of them begin at the first of the year that this becomes a topic uh, that's put on their agenda. And my hope in all this discussion that we're having now is that there are state legislators out there that are thinking and looking at this and saying, well, at least we could deal with it in Louisiana or we could deal with it in Minnesota or we could deal with it in Arizona. Uh, and that has an impetus and an impact uh, that builds. So, yes. Uh, matter of fact, that's, that's probably how it's going to work uh, because we'll get probably stuck in the mud in, uh, in Washington on this because everybody's gets focused and if it gets too big of a battle, you just can't move the thing anyway and you could break it out through the states. Can I just fo focus this? I mean, I'm already thinking of the Greenwood bill. This is the cloning bill that would just ban so-called reproductive cloning, or clone and kill as some opponents have called it. Actually, preempts, there's a preemptive clause there. Is there and I wouldn't yeah, worry about that. Yeah, it would And we personally, of course, have state laws that, their, that, that thereby would, would, would be struck down. Mm. And I suspect that's a, that's a bio clause. <laughs> yeah, yeah. May I uh, just thank you in closing. Uh, Sam Casey has a, a, a letter to the president that he'd like a lot of people to sign, if you're willing to, about embryonic stem cell uh, research and urging the president to stay with his campaign position that, that he's opposed to it. I would, uh, would hope you would be praying for the president for wisdom uh, on this decision. And uh, would, would you mind joining me in a prayer now? If you wouldn't mind doing that. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We give you all the glory. And we, um, we ask for wisdom for our country, for guidance. We ask to be a nation again that in God we trust is, uh, is our motto and it's on our hearts, not just on our money. Um, help us with these difficult decisions. Help us to know truth and to see it and share it. To speak truth, to speak it in your love. To be bold, with a holy boldness that knows no bound. We pray for the president. We pray for the president for wisdom and that he would see your way in dealing with these very difficult issues. That he would oppose the use of tax funds for embryonic stem cell research. And then on these others, he would lead a nation and lead the world in saving humanity as it should be in your image. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.